you know, the thing about this is, is it's, um, it's hard to see. It's hard to see that I don't look sick, you know. My name's Seth Ellingsworth. I was a RCT, radiological control technician at the Hanford Tank Farms. Seth Ellingsworth doesn't work anymore. At the moment, he can't because he can't breathe. He used to be strong enough to tackle mountains. Now he can barely climb the stairs. He spends most of his time sitting in his living room drinking coffee. Do you really feel like this ruined your life? Well, I, I, every day I struggle to breathe. Every day I wake up and I, I have to use my breathing machine. You know, um, I, I have to be careful everywhere I go. I can't do things with my kids. Um, yeah, yeah, there's, I, I, yeah, it did, yeah. <coughs> well, give me a minute, I'm coming. When he does leave the house, Ellingsworth is leashed to his nebulizer. He also takes a combination of inhalers, steroids, and COPD medicine. So right now I've been diagnosed with uh, reactive airway disease, severe asthma, and vocal cord dysfunction. I don't know if there's more to come or not. Seth is so sensitive to what's in the air, he needs a mask, but he didn't want the traditional kind that makes him look sick. I don't wear it going into a gas station. <laughs> <laughs> Late at night, you know. <laughs> there are jokes now and then about what his life has become, but there's yeah. also anger, a lot of it. And it's directed at the government facility where he worked. And the whole time, I, I had no idea that I was breathing in stuff that, you know, could damage my health, that could uh, ruin my life, you know, that could injure my lungs and, and make every part of every day so difficult. I, I had no idea the risk. I, I just went to work, I did my job, and. I trusted that uh, these people were, were taking care of us. We met Seth Ellingsworth as we started investigating something called the Hanford site, more than 2,300 miles across the country from our home base in DC. For months, our team has been looking into the facility, reading hundreds of pages of reports, going through court files, talking to experts. Along the way, we found out not just that workers at Hanford were getting sick, but that no one really understands what's hurting them. And although the government doesn't really acknowledge the sickness, they're still spending a ton of money on it. All right, so this place is a federal facility. It was actually built back in the 40s. It's in the middle of the desert in the eastern section of Washington state. Most people have never heard of it, but it actually played a huge role in World War II. Mm, are you talking about like the Manhattan Project? Exactly. So they made the plutonium that they eventually dropped on Nagasaki, but 70 years later, they're still dealing with that, this whole new legacy, and it's pretty ugly. My name is Tom Carpenter. I'm the executive director of an organization called Hanford Challenge. We're a group that monitors the cleanup at the most contaminated nuclear site in the United States. It is a monumental task, monitoring a cleanup project that began back in 1989, and it's going to continue for decades to come, costing taxpayers billions of dollars. But the cost of the cleanup and the problems and delays that could push the deadline for the cleanup back as far as 2040, that's just one part of the story. Hanford offers everything a storyteller would want. And just like this government video says, there's intrigue and controversy. Although Circa also discovered silence and sickness, with more than a billion dollars already spent to compensate people who've been harmed at Hanford. It's taxpayer money being used as the feds ignore warnings from experts again and again. It was the strongest report ever. It found all kinds of major, major problems. The Hanford site and the government was kind of they, they immediately start, started talking about needing another report. I was like, what? No. The reports he's talking about focused mostly on the underground tanks at the Hanford site, the ones packed with millions of gallons of radioactive waste. There are 177 of them at Hanford in what they call the tank farms. It is the largest contaminated facility. If this is the most contaminated site in America, why is this not priority one? Headlines every single day about the problems at Hanford. The government really doesn't want it to be headlines, and I think they're pretty successful at make, you know, quieting things down. 
Carpenter has taken the fight from the Hanford site to the federal court, trying to speak up for workers whose job it is to mop up the mess of nuclear history. Can you put the camera down, please? You got a reason to be out here with the camera? Yeah. He's trying to be a loud voice a against a culture of silence that we found extends well beyond Hanford's fences. He says he's a journalist doing a story. The Hanford site itself is huge. It's more than 500 square miles, about half the size of the state of Rhode Island. It goes on as far as the eye can see. But here's the weird thing. Once you drive back into town, it's like this place isn't even here. They just don't even talk about it. I don't think it even crosses our minds on a daily basis that that is going on unless it's on the news or the radio. What's happening in Hanford is part of this area's culture, a theme in a local pizza joint, a mascot at the high school. Nuclear history sounds fun when it's served on a platter or cheered at a pep rally. But the very real danger is something people who live here don't always acknowledge. I've never heard of anybody getting sick. No one. No. That's despite Tom Carpenter's best efforts. He and his team have tried everything to get the word out. But Hanford's own have been hurt. Aggressive mailing campaigns, kitschy t-shirts. They even staged a pub crawl. But fighting denial surrounding this site is easier said than done. They won't admit there's a connection between chemical vapors exposures and health effects. Uh, you know, they'll say, oh, well, there's temporary effects. Uh, no, there, there are very long-term and lasting effects. Seth is living proof. I just breathe oxygen right from that bag. Without it, I'm not able to do this for but a few minutes and I start running out of breath. Hooked up to a machine, laboring on a simple stationary bike ride. This is progress. I'm having to get used to not being able to do things, so. But you have hope, you don't have hope. I've gotten better from when it happened. I've gotten a lot better from the first um, three or four months, you know, that was the worst time. Um, and I, I, I do hope that I'll just keep getting better. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm back. <laughs> Sorry. Um. I kind of feel I'm not a wife anymore. I'm a caretaker. It has drastically changed our life. A career at Hanford can impact more than just the people who work there. My name is Bertola Vogadin, and I'm Abe's wife. I'm uh, Abelardo Garza. Uh, I'm an instrument tech. I worked at Hanford for, since 1983. We were out calibrating some instruments. I just all of a sudden ended up with a nosebleed. It felt like somebody was sitting on my chest. There was no alarm bell, no signal something toxic had been released. But what Abe and Seth both believe made them sick on the tank farms is something the feds have been warned about for years, spontaneous toxic vapor clouds. On the farms, potentially toxic fumes are sent up through stacks that are supposed to put the danger high above and out of the way. But those fumes can also escape other ways, creating those rogue clouds. There was no doubt in my mind that that's what did it. It is actually kind of nuts how many times these tank vapor clouds do pop up in different government different government reports and whatnot. They're all over this report. This is pretty wonky. It's called the Hanford Tank Vapor Assessment Report. We're going to call it TVAC because it's just too long otherwise. 150 pages. It was compiled by a group of academics and scientists that say they got no influence at all from the people at Hanford. But after weeks of calling and emailing the 10 people from that group, we're told we can't talk to any of them, even though what they said on paper has been public for almost three years. They got a lot of recommendations. The group laid out 47 recommendations, highlighting some pretty head-scratching issues, considering what it is they actually do here. They're not already doing that? They found the people measuring chemicals in the air after people get sick don't always know what they're doing. Even when they do, the list of chemicals they check for is incomplete. And Hanford's constant message about how safe this place is is based on a theory that doesn't actually apply here. You're working in the most 
toxic site in the United States. For them to say it's safe, it's, it, it's crazy. Cleanup is a very, very big deal. We have current and future generations to worry about. All right, so the stuff in here is blowing my mind. You know how at Hanford, the people who do the testing, these industrial hygiene technicians, they're the ones you would think have the basics on chemical hazards, exposures, and risks. But this report here is basically saying that their training, their resources, and their expertise is totally insufficient. They just can't do the job. There are echoes of kind of that inability to do the job here in this 2016 report from NIOSH. It looks like uh, they hired a bunch of super inexperienced IHTs. The quality of the courses they were training them was relatively inconsistent. And then it looks like they also signed off on people going out into the field and testing for chemicals without ever really verifying their skills. That sounds smart. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think we both know that all the training in the world realistically isn't going to matter if you don't actually show up on time to do your job. And they don't show up on time. No. This one talks about how sometimes it can take hours and they cite right here 120 minutes sometimes for a variety of reasons. You're not measuring all the chemicals that could be present in the air and you haven't done any analysis about how these chemicals might mix together and cause an additive or even a synergistic effect. Um, so uh, you're the effort to explain it away, that's what I call it, is like, oh, there's no problem, has not been matched in any way, shape, or form by the effort to control these vapors. That's another big problem. Hanford has measured thousands of samples and come up with a list of chemicals of potential concern, but those are chemicals we know to test for. We're talking about stirring up atomic waste from another century here. No one could know about, let alone test for the reactions they could cause or the chemicals they could produce. Reports show we don't even have the technology to sample for them. So just because testers don't find the chemicals we know are bad, doesn't mean workers haven't been exposed to something potentially dangerous. Every worker out there should know the risks and should know what they're breathing in. They should know everything about these chemicals and there shouldn't be any question as to what it'll do to us, you know? All right, so we know that after talking to all of these people, they still have tons of questions about safety. It's not resolved, and it feels like when we're talking about Hanford, this all comes down to semantics. Yeah, it really does. Here's the problem, is that the way that Hanford measures safety is based off of something called an occupational exposure limit, or an OEL, and that's a term that comes up a lot in a lot of these government reports. The way that those are measured is essentially by taking the known chemicals, and measuring them over the span of an eight hour work day. The whole day that exactly. they're there breathing in yep. this stuff. Here's the problem though, is that we know that's not how people are actually getting sick. They're getting sick based off of these spontaneous exposures. So these OELs realistically don't apply. Don't apply. So workers like Abe are told they're safe and it's true based on some of the science. I uh, regret thinking that they were looking out for my safety. Trusting them. Trusting them, yeah, yeah. I regret that. The TVAT report makes it clear Plus there is a link between those random vapor clouds and the kind of illnesses the people we've talked to have experienced. But even having it in black and white doesn't mean workers have it easy as they go for treatment and through workers' comp. This is just half of the medical records. Families like the Garzas have the frustration of the system to add to their suffering. It's more than a full-time job. I can't keep up with it. I got into this because they pissed me off. This is Faye Veliger. She knows better than anyone that Hanford workers doing battle with their bodies also have to wage war with the system. It makes it hard to get workers comp and payback for what they suffered by getting hurt. I was determined to fight the U.S. Department of Energy because that's who I was fighting. And I wasn't going to let him win. She worked at Hanford too and claims she got sick after breathing in one of those rogue clouds back in 2002. Says it took years to get compensation. 15 years later though, her living room is now stacked floor to ceiling with bins from somebody else's fight. She represents Hanford workers whose claims are stuck in limbo. I was not gonna let my government behave this way and just walk away because they, what they were doing is wrong and it's grievous. And they're doing it to people who are least able to fight back. How often are you successful in taking these people through the process and winning their claim for them? You know, um, if I kept those statistics, I could get discouraged. 
So in Washington state, it's a little bit complicated because when these workers have a problem, they file for something called LNI, Labor and Industries, and then that gets farmed out to this third party. So that all sounds fine and good, but right now this third party is on the radar of these two U.S. senators. Cool, okay, so what are they saying about it? Well, we've tried to talk to them personally. We've contacted their offices, the two of them together, more than two dozen times. Right now, though, they want the inspector general to get involved because they're hearing from Hanford workers that either they're being intimidated when they're making these claims or potentially that their claims are being arbitrarily dismissed or just discredited altogether. Hmm. Going, to, going to the pharmacy, that's my you know one month supply of stuff here. Even a bag full of prescriptions isn't enough to make some people believe. Seth has heard around town that people think he's playing sick. Proving it and getting his workers' comp claim through the system took months. I mean, there's, there's a lot of money in this medicine. You know, I, I wouldn't be able to buy it if they weren't covering it. They're intermediary uh, health care resolver whose mission was mainly to block the health care or giving health care to these workers who've been affected by the vapors. Washington State Representative Larry Haler pitched a bill trying to make it easier for Hanford workers to qualify for workers comp. It didn't survive, but silence at Hanford did. Haler claims he never heard about problems until last year, even though he was a manager at Hanford. I worked at the Hanford site for 40 years. Worker safety has always been always been our primary mission uh, and it seems that that primary mission of worker safety has slipped. When safety slips there are consequences. At Hanford that means injuries and illnesses for the workers who not only file with the state but also the feds. You have to show that there is more than a 50 percent chance that exposure to that chemical caused your illness. So if I'm a worker who can't necessarily identify what I breathed in, what's the chance my claim will be paid out if I get sick? Yeah, so I mean, that's a difficult case. And Dr. William Spriggs spent years in leadership at the Labor Department, which wades through thousands of claims from government workers who say they've been harmed. As of early May, Hanford accounted for nearly 29,000 claims. Almost 60% of them didn't get paid. In difficult cases, Spriggs says the government's hands are often tied no matter how tragic the story. Sympathy in their hearts, it doesn't count for squat in the claims process. They can only do what the law allows. So as much as they might like to be helpful, the law is clear about who can get benefits and who can't. Still, there's already been a lot of money shelled out that acknowledges health problems at Hanford, with claims paid to thousands of workers who got sick or even died. Since 2001, $1.3 billion has been paid in medical bills and compensation related solely to Hanford. But it's not the contractors that run Hanford who pay these claims. It's you. That $1.3 billion comes straight from the U.S. Treasury. So if contractors are off the hook when their workers get hurt, advocates say that's not exactly motivation to make safety a top priority. They don't do anything because it's the right thing to do. They do it because they have to and to, you know, satisfy, you know, the people who are giving them a hard time. Do it for the right reasons, right? And that starts with acknowledgement. I mean, they have yet to acknowledge even that there's a harm associated with these vapors or much less that anyone has been harmed. It's like, well, why are you doing any of this? If you really believe that, why not just stick your own head right there in the vent and suck that stuff all day long? And then maybe, you know, if you survive that experience, right? Or if you want to pipe it into your office instead of out at the tanks, you know, then people will say, well, Joe over there, he's sucking the stuff all day long, right? So it must be okay, but they don't do that. They don't even go to the site. So what has Hanford done? We asked the Department of Energy to talk about its efforts many times in Washington state and here in D.C. And we also sent them specific questions that went unanswered. We know there's never been a public health study looking at all the Hanford workers who got sick or even an effort by the feds to even track them. But Hanford says it has taken a number of steps to strengthen worker safety and predict and prepare for potential vapor exposures. They say they plan to implement new monitoring and detection equipment. Last year, we know they started offering supplied air tanks to workers, and last month, they started giving them air purifying respirators. 
So you made this website. Yeah. Seth Ellingsworth, well, he's found a way to breathe new life into his own routine. He started a website. It's an effort to kill some of his idle time while he's out of work. But it's more than that. He profiles workers who've gotten sick. Their stories are now his story. He's just waiting to add another profile to the page. This was known about for years before it happened to me because it happened to other people. And it didn't have to happen to me. And it didn't have to happen to people after me. And it, and it still is, you know, it's still going to happen.